And so really just trying to learn about how data is being applied in innovative ways. And that's going to be what we're here today. So we have uh, some folks from the Geese College of Business, the Disruption Lab. They're going to talk about different innovations they've been doing and how data plays a part in that. So I'll turn it over to our groups and they will introduce themselves. So we've got three different presentations today. Thank you, Ben. Um, hello, everybody. So my name is Igor. I am the project manager for this semester with the collaboration project between AMD and the Disruption Lab here at UIC. I'm joined by yeah, and uh, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm his boss, so. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, so he's engineering manager for many of the projects here at Gila, uh, including AMD. He was um, PM also for the same project last semester. So today, here's the agenda. Just want to talk about some core issues and motivation for why we're working on the project, where it came from. Um, also, our methodology, how we're approaching, how we're uh, just solving the issue. And then just show an early result as well as some demo of what we're working on right now. That's it. So before anything else, here's our, our team. So yeah, just want to thank all of them for their hard work during the semester. It's been great. Yeah. Okay, now moving on to core issues, our motivation for the project. The whole idea is that battery lifespan efficiency uh, they decrease with high charge intensity, right? And this graph does just eliminate that. Um, as we get into higher intensity charging, the curve gets steeper and steeper. We lose charge cycles in the long run, right? Of course, that's bad for longevity, longevity planned obsolescence. So we want to combat that as much as we can. So if we could just get through, yeah. So the whole idea is that we want to find a way to charge slower while keeping user satisfaction. And that's, of course, charging smarter. But how, how can we do that? So. From that, we want to predict user behavior and then charge accordingly. We want to find a way to do that. And then we break this issue into two specific parts, which then comes to solution. So if you want to predict user behavior, charge accordingly, the whole idea is that we have one challenge, which is we want to use RL to do that because we want to predict user behavior. But then, yeah, you can, yeah, you can just get it. If we map each minute of each day for a week, that's 140, 40 um, by seven matrix, that's a lot, right? And then you factor in other um, components of the RL training. You're doing current state of charge, you're doing duration of charge, all that adds up. Uh, it's unfeasible to, to compute, it's unfeasible to train. At least with the harder we have here, it's, it's really hard. So um, we have to reduce the dimensionality of data because it's too computationally expensive. Um, but then, how do we reduce the dimensionality data in that sense? So the first idea is that we break the problem up into two parts, to two different challenges. So one of them is how long are we gonna keep charging for? How do we decide? And then how do we ensure, adjust the charging rate based on that, right? So, so for the first part of the challenge, we use a KNN. So reducing the dimensionality data in that sense. And then the second idea is using reinforcement learning after that, using shallow RL to reduce computing costs later on, right? Um, KNN itself has its own uh, quirks, and I just want to talk a little bit about how data is incorporated in that. So we used 15 minutes time, time steps. We thought that was a good resolution to, to start with and kind of represent all use cases. And then we're generating um, user generated charging schedules so we can represent different types of users, different types of people. Um, typical students, which is most active at night, a typical nine to five job, not as active during night and more active during those hours. Totally a regular user, random schedule, just charging all over the place. Then we pass that through the KNN and we get a likelihood of charging vector. So we can, we can basically predict when those users averaging out across spans of weeks and months how they're behaving and, 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 and when they're most likely to charge. Yeah, just a, a quick clarification real quick. So in case um, you guys haven't heard of KN, and so we're using k nearest neighbors algorithm, and it's basically just a classification algorithm based on a system of voting. Um, and so the way the way this uh, k nearest neighbor solution really works is that we're keeping track of the user's uh, previous uh, charge schedule, as in you know when you plug in the when you plug in your computer versus when you unplug your computer, and we know every 15 minutes whether or not you're charging, right? 
And so what we have, what we do then is, you know, we'll get, we'll gather uh, around five weeks of information, and from there we take an average across those five weeks, right? So basically, let's say for example, um, across these five weeks, every Monday at 8 a.m., you're always charging, right? So that gives us a very high confidence that maybe sometimes within the next week on Monday, one Monday 8 a.m., you will also be charging, right? So basically, we uh, gather this uh, entire matrix of uh, coordinates from uh, with x-axis being the day of the week, y-axis being the minute of the day, and then what we do is across that matrix, let's say we're you know encountering a, uh, a new time of day, right? Like, let's say we're currently trying to predict what you're going to do uh, Monday 8 p.m. What we do is we look at the we look into this matrix that we have, and then we look for the nearest points to our current time in that matrix, right? And using k-nearest neighbors, we essentially take a vote. Okay, so let's say the nearest four points around our uh, Monday 8 p.m. is uh, all of them have charging, right? So you can say with a fair certainty that you know within that within that area you're pretty likely to be charging, right? And so this is how we sort of predict you know whether or not you're going to be charging. And obviously there's a little bit of a subtlety to this because you know what if we have five weeks where the first three where the first three weeks uh, at this particular time you're charging, and then the next two times you're not charging, right? How do we deal with that? Um, so this sort of um, you know, this is sort of where this uh, little gradient we have here comes in with the likelihood, right? We actually put a likelihood rating on your uh, current time step uh, to be able to essentially give us a gauge of how, how likely you are to be charging. It's not, it's, so it's no longer a zero or one type of uh, data point, it's anywhere from zero to 0 0.9 or uh, one. And this is gonna sort of help us in our next step that we're gonna talk about in terms of how we gauge um, your you know, your probability of charging and also how long we think you're going to be charging for, so. Yeah, so this idea is very important, like, what, how long are we going to be charging for? That's the whole question we're trying to try to answer, but still, we got to reduce the missionality further because we still have a 1 by 32 vector, right? And that's, if we input that into the, our little model, that's still a lot of data. So from the KNN, we have this likelihood of charging vector. Um, but the idea is that we're going to extract only two numbers from it. One of them is the duration of the running streak, yeah, you can pass it, yeah. The running streak of the period where we have a likelihood of charging over 0 0.6, and that's contiguous, right? So as soon as we break that, that probability streak, as soon as we are not certain, but are identifying a likelihood that we're gonna unplug and we're not gonna be charging anymore, that's when we stop that duration count. And then we created a, an integrity factor which just accounts for uncertainty over the span of that duration. Because you can have a scenario where the first few time steps are, are very likely, and then all of a sudden you still have 0 0.6, but you have, I don't know, 10 time steps where that's 0 0.6. So you're very, very likely to be charging the first few time steps and not likely at all. So we average out those confidences as well to create a single number that represents how diffuse that probability is over time, and if we're confident that we're going to keep charging for that extended period of time. And these two numbers account for both charging prediction and uncertainty on the data. That's the idea. Right. Yeah, so that's a way to model the KNN without drastically increasing um, dimensionality. So then we can pass those into KNN, we can pass those into um, shallow RL which is, has its own uh, specificity. So we add the data from the KNN to the current SOC, as well as uh, an action space um, um, variable. And action, action space is very important for the reinforcement learning um, approach that we're using. You can, you, can, you can skip it. Real quick, SOC is state of charge. Yeah, SOC is state of charge. So we're joining those together into this big, nice matrix, and we're passing it into the shallow RL model. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah. So for shallow RL, um, we're first we're learning, of course, good for predicting user behavior. We're looking at Sarser in this case, which is state action reward state action. Um, basically, self-indulging um, loop, self-fulfilling loop, where we have an agent and an environment that it's interacting with. In this case, the agent is our reinforcement learning model. The environment is our simulated battery. Uh, with capacity and, and state of charge and 
the duration of the charge and all those other factors that are represented in the matrix. And then if you could just skip. Yeah. So we have the 4D tensor, which is coupled and then, yeah. So we visit each state of the tensor, updating the best action. Um, and then the action space does exactly that for us. So we basically visit every possible state in that 4D tensor, um, but in a statistical manner, so that we visit the most relevant states first, and we keep track of the most relevant and the most um, optimal charging states by recording the action space variable and recording the best action age case. And that's also done by a reward. So this is a reward function that we came up. Um, the graph is very faint to see. There's a little, little curve over there. Um, that just shows what we're trying to minimize. In this case, we're trying to minimize the time that we spend in that plateau, right? Because we're, we start charging, and so let's say that we have very little time to charge. We want to charge as fast as we can. But if we charge too fast and we overshoot, what happens is that we stay a long time at 100%, and that's potential time that we could be charging for that we did. We were just stuck at 100%. Probably. So we penalize the time that we spend at 100% charge that we lost charging already. And we also penalize if we undershoot and we charge for more time than we expected and we charge slower than we wanted to, in which case we're not gonna end up with a full battery at the end of the charge cycle, which is also not ideal, right? So I just wanna run a quick little demo uh, and show uh, our training and also some visualizations that we did. And then we wrap up with uh, Sarsa. That's it. All right. So this is our, our training environment. Here's um, some of the configuration files as well as. Oh, is it not sure? Oh, that's great. Let's share it real quick. Let's see. All right. Here we go. All right. So is my screen over here? Yeah. That's good. All right. So we can just run our training environment here, and what it's going to do is generate a new training file right here, yep. as well as see the environment. So it's just going to run for a uh, thousand hours here. It's going to train the model, generate some visualizations. So let's see, open this real quick. Right. Yep. So this is our KNN heat map. Uh, again, just predicting likelihood of charge. This is probably a student. Uh, yeah, charging overnight, probably around six, seven hours of, of, of charge overnight, and then using more or less over yeah period of the weekends and during the day. All right, and then heat table. This is the big matrix that I was talking about with the best action in other states, um, including state of charge, and then the input from the cannon. So each of these um, graphs here is from an integrity factor. So basically, as we get more confident that we're gonna be charging for a long time, um, we can also get more confident to charge at different uh, rates and have more variability in that. And that's represented in, in the way that we see. This is, of course, just a thousand apples. This is really fast, I just trained here in my laptop, but you can imagine that this scales up as we go into, um, into higher training networks. And then, Fair warning, this last visualization is not totally complete because we haven't done data interpolation for one I'm going to show right now. Uh, so it might be a little messy because we're following in thousand data points, but still I just want to show that um, the points that you see in red are from the model that I just trained right now on my laptop, and the points that you see in blue are from an untrained network that's never seen um, data before. And so, what this shows here is that as we progress through the episodes, um, the y-axis is showing the difference in the optimal charge. So the difference uh, in that time that we spent um, at the top, right? So it's, it's, it's clear to see that red points in general are lower in the graph, which means that we're wasting less time charging for um, charging 400 cents. We're charging more optimally. And yep, that's... That's our model for right now. Thank you so much. Brian, do you want to add anything else? Oh, no, I think we can, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions in the audience. I think we should start answering those. Right. Those are probably clear, so I feel clear of a few uh, questions as well. Um, 
can just. So I think the big, yeah, the big question in the chat um, is they're wondering about the choice of KNN versus yeah. the regression model. So can you comment on just if you explore different modeling techniques and how you land at KNN? Yeah, so um, our, our, the KNN was sort of a decision we made a little while back, but uh, we started out you know, asking the question how do we determine you know, when a user is charging and how long a user is charging for, right? Um, and so that's what this was during, I think, summer of 2022. And uh, you know, we started out exploring a few different uh, methods. So I think one of the methods was a, uh, it's a, I think it's a moving regression, moving average regression. Um, I forgot the name of the model, but you know, we, we tried a few different things. And so basically what, 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 I, what ended up happening is that um, a lot of the, the, the more, how do I say, the more like continuous data type of regressions models that we tried ended up giving us very, uh, ended up giving us a flat line at the average. Um, and so, for example, let's say, because the thing is, the, the, the nature of our data is binary, right? We have zeros and ones um, across a period of time. And uh, one of the issues we ran into when, when we tried to model that is we would, you know, our model would start out predicting very well for the first couple time steps and then average out to a completely flat line at somewhere around like 0 0.6, 0 0.5, or whatever, right? Now, obviously, that could, that could uh, this error could have been caused by the fact that, you know, we're bad at coding, but um, <clears throat> the, the conclusion was that, you know, because of the binary nature of our, of our uh, data, of our data set, it becomes sort of hard to try to start finding averages, right? Um, and but so, what we do instead is k-nearest neighbors. Where k-nearest -near, k neighbors will take uh, it will take sort of like a voting system from its uh, from a point's nearest uh, neighbors, and then decide whether that point should belong to a certain category or not, right? So this, I think, you know, this was a, our solution. To come, our, you know, the solution that we came up with to deal with the slightly more uh, binary, binary nature of our data set. Um, so then, you know, when we when we end up on you know a point that we're currently trying to predict, well, we just look back at the history of all of the points, and then we say, okay, so its nearest, uh, you know, its five nearest neighbors have told us that you know there's a fairly high chance of it being uh, a one, and a very low chance of it being a zero. That's why we consider this new point a one. So that's sort of the, the why you know why we ended up deciding on k nearest neighbors, and to sort of like you know. Um, you expand upon that, right? Um, you know, obviously our data set by the end of this k nearest neighbors, you know, uh, if, you, if you even just look at the uh, the diagram here, right? It's it's also not completely binary. It's uh, from 0, 0.0 to 0 0.9. And the reason this, the reason we sort of uh, added this additional dimensionality is because you know we want to satisfy the user. And so we're not going to be able to satisfy the user if all we do is zeros and ones, right? Because if I say, okay, you know, you have a 0.6% or 0.5% chance of charging for the next hour or so, you know, we want to be conservative rather than say, you know, you're going to be charging charging completely for the next hour, right? So we we do we do basically um, separate the zero and one into a bunch of different categories, and then we categorize into the different confidence levels between zero and uh, one. So we're also waiting. We're also waiting recent data, right? So um, one other thing with the KNN, just just to top it off, is that we're also weighing um, recent data more heavily, right? And that's that's easier to do with the KNN. That's that's uh, that's something that we can implement very easily. So if the user's behavior changes drastically, right, over the next uh, one week or two weeks, that can be reflected more heavily and, and way quicker than if we were just doing a moving average and we take into account five or six weeks uh, behind, and that's, that's still having an impact, right? So, I want to minimize that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a question on uh, the data. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the value is binary, but uh, what each sample represents? Does it represent a user, or does it represent a period of time for each sample? Do you, do you mean the binary, the, the, the binary values of the, the representation? No, I mean, uh, you, you have a set of data that you work with using KNN. Yeah. Uh, you have a set of data that you work with using KNN. Yeah. Okay. So each sample here, what does each sample represent? Does it represent a user or does it represent a time uh, period? Yeah, 
so it's a so each uh, sample that we uh, input into the Canon is um, a week's worth of one user data, right? And and they're scheduled over a week of, of charging. So it's binary in the sense that either you're charging or you're not charging, and that's reflected over a week time span. Yeah, and so uh, really the 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 core of, the core of this entire uh, data set is that you have a day of week and a time of day, and that gives you an XY coordinate where we can put a one or a zero on. For you are charging at this time of day during this time of week, or you're not charging during that time. Right? That's sort of our raw data format. And then we go on to sort of process that a little bit. Can you hear us now? All right. um, so we, so uh, basically we then go on to process that binary data and co compute that average across five weeks. Right? Because the thing is, obviously, one week of a person's schedule might not be representative of his usual schedule. Right? And so that's why we perform that uh, process later. I think you had a question. Right? Yeah. yeah. How is the data collection done? How, how do you collect the data? Is this something that I run on my computer? Or? Yeah, so uh, currently we have, a, we have a Python script that uh, we compile into an executable, and then we can you just, it, it turns on when you turn on your computer. Um, and then they'll start collecting data once every 15 minutes. Um, now, obviously, there's there's a, a few other a few other nuances to this particular solution, right? Because you never want you might be wondering, what if my computer dies, right? If my computer dies, it's not on, it's not recording data. And so with that, we basically assume the worst case scenario, which is you're not charging during that time. And so basically, uh, now obviously you might be charging, but the thing is, we try to be as conservative as possible with our modeling to basically uh, encourage the system to charge a little bit quicker than it needs to be if we're unsure, right? And this way, you know, obviously, you know, we're looking at two things here, obviously, where we have user satisfaction and, you know, health, health of your battery. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think user satisfaction sort of is one step above this health of the battery matter. So that's why we try to be a little bit more conservative uh, in terms of our charging. Okay, let's just move on. So there's a couple other questions in the chat. I'll let you guys, if you guys want to answer it and stay on Zoom, we can get to the next presenter. Okay, sure. Thank you all very much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Manoth. I'm the project manager for this project, uh, State of Illinois RDBMS, and this is... Hi everyone, my name is Sanskar. I'm an engineering manager at the Disruption Lab and currently a junior in computer science at UAUC. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the State of Illinois chain of projects that we've had for around three semesters now. And let's get started with uh, the project overview from our first ever project two semesters ago. So when this project came to us, uh, the state of Illinois just wanted to kind of analyze the state of the cannabis industry. What this meant is analyze diversity, stuff that the uh, CROO wanted to know, which is the Cannabis Regulation Oversight Office, and um, kind of like what rules and regulations should they put, are there current rules and regulations working, and um, just the requirement of uh, new businesses, how that was going, and just like the overall, what does the cannabis industry look like since it is so upcoming. And so the timeline for our project was uh, to start storing data in MongoDB, then using the stored data in visualization tools such as Power BI and Tableau, and then we kind of went back and did some data cleaning because we found that a lot of the data was not in a very useful state, um, and this kind of changed our data, data visualizations later on too. So yeah, so when we were preparing the data, we removed bad data, so um, like data that was just like people put in, didn't really put in any effort into like answering the questions properly, um, adding some unformatted data, appending data like like entered through Excel sheets uh, rather than the actual form. We got a lot of data uh, from these companies that were just Excel files rather than like actually putting in like answering through our forms just because the state couldn't really regulate that well. And then um, importing all this data to Tableau, which, is, which was our preferred um, data visualization tool. So let's talk about the MongoDB side of things. Uh, MongoDB is a uh, database uh, that lets you uh, store data really easily and manipulate this data. And so our backend was Mongo Atlas, which was our server. 
Um, this allows us to um, host the data in a really reliable way um, and manage who gets access. Uh, obviously, the state needed access, our team needed access, but making sure no one else can access that data since it is really sensitive. Um, and so, yeah. Um, on the front end side of things, we have MongoDB Compass. Um, all it did is allow us to use MongoDB in a very, very easy format. Um, it allowed us to connect with others, allowed us to um, all work at the same time, think of Google Drive. Um, and um, yeah, I think it was our saving grace because none of us really knew how to use MongoDB that well at the time. And so this allowed us to really get into the like, swing of things fast. And so let's talk about the data cleaning part of this uh, project. Um, so one thing that we had to do was merge the data sets. Um, we had a lot of different data uh, sources, and uh, we kind of had to figure out how to put it in one compact way so that our data visualizations can take data from one location, um, as well as just help any future readers of these data sets uh, be able to actually understand what they're looking at. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of uh, empty survey responses. Uh, what this meant is people would just go into the survey and then click done, um, and then we have like 0% completion. So we had to delete all of those. Um, we had to remove duplicates, uh, so we had a lot of uh, data entries that were like someone filled out from the same company twice, and it'd be as like a 10% and like a 70%. So we had to go with the 70% completion. Um, and then making sure that everything, like, everything was just a, in a format that made sense to the state. Um, and so that was the whole data cleaning portion. Uh, this was done during the second half of the semester. And then going back, um, so this was just our code. Um, yeah, uh, it's not really intensive. Uh, it's pretty simple just because um, we didn't do anything crazy complex, uh, we just kind of added, merged, and uh, that kind of stuff. So let's talk about the interesting part of this project, which is the data visualizations. When we started, we had two options, Power BI, as you see up here, and Tableau, uh, and we kind of went ahead with both. Uh, so Power BI, um, it's made by Microsoft, so there was that plus, um, and um, it allowed us to create a lot of graphs easily, as opposed to its counterpart, which is Tableau, it was really hard to get into, but once we did get into it, uh, a lot of these visualizations that they had were super powerful. Um, and so the only downside to Tableau is to be able to create any Tableau um, like visualizations, you had to pay for um, Tableau desktop, but since we were students, we got that for free for like a year. And so let's talk about Tableau versus Power BI. So Power BI, if you want to get the pro version, be able to um, synchronously work on the same uh, visualizations. Uh, the cost was $9.99 per month. Uh, it had a very simple user, uh, face, uh, user interface, which allowed us to create some basic graphs really early on. And it has less support for the browser version, which was only uh, on MacBook. But for the people that were working with Windows, uh, they had no time, uh, they had no uh, problem getting these visualizations up and running. On the other side, Tableau had different plans. Um, all these plans, uh, like obviously, are tiered. Tableau Viewer allows you to interact with uh, existing Tableau uh, dashboards. Um, Tableau Explorer allowed you to search some up, uh, create your own, kind of mess with it a little bit. And the Tableau Creator allowed you to create a whole new one really easily, and yeah. Interactivity means that we were allowed to like create graphs where you, if you clicked on one portion of the graph, you saw something interesting, it would scale to that portion of the graph. So let's say uh, we have a pie graph that says, you know, 50% um, of employees are white, 30% uh, being Asian. If I click the 30% being Asian, it would scale all of the graphs to that 30% of Asians. So let's say um, we have a graph that talks about how people feel in the workplace, you know, uh, on a scale of one to 10. If we click that 30% Asian, it would scale that to only the responses from those 30%. So 
So that was really cool. And the other thing is Tableau allowed us to data manage easily. We created a lot of Python scripts um, to create new data sets so we can manipulate how our graphs looked. Uh, let's say we like kind of like going back to the interactivity part, uh, but allowed us to do it on the um, exact like the raw files themselves. So yeah, um, we ended up going with Tableau, and so that's uh, where our project kind of led us. Thanks, Hani. Um, yeah, so now I can kind of dive into the current progress that we're making uh, this semester. Uh, a lot of it is quite similar to uh, the past semesters, but this semester we're basically focusing on creating a relational database model with the data sets that we were given um, as responses from the diversity survey that were sent out to the companies and vendors and employees of cannabis distribution. So diving in uh, really quick to the tools that we're using this semester. Uh, to store the data uh, efficiently and kind of organize it, we're using uh, MySQL. Uh, so putting it all into MySQL Workbench basically promoted uh, organizing and the team's able to kind of make queries on the data set. Uh, in terms of the back end, uh, we're using both Python and AWS RDS. Uh, AWS has a great relational database system where uh, it allows for a uh, connection between the database uh, and the back end and then the front end and it has its own built-in API. So that's what we're going to use and then in terms of the front end, uh, we're developing uh, a user interface using React and CSS uh, to make kind of the queries more simple for the user. So uh, diving into kind of like, again, the description of what we're doing this semester is basically just developing a full stack web app. Um, this allows like, users, uh, uh, anyone in, uh, like at U of I or uh, the state can basically query the data um, from this, these responses. Uh, and so kind of like the features and progress we've made so far is again, kind of uh, cleaning up the data. So as Sunny mentioned earlier, uh, there were a lot of inconsistencies in the data. Uh, and so a lot of the responses were either uh, inconsistent or there were some errors. So we basically developed a Python script which I'll show in a few, uh, few seconds. Uh, next, we made a relational model, so we created basically a simple uh, ER diagram and also a schema that basically maps uh, the data tables using like different keys. So again, like primary and four key. Uh, these basically just like kind of identify what is similar and different in the data sets. Uh, then lastly, we developed a Figma model. Uh, again, this is just a rough draft of what our front end will look like uh, by the end of the semester, and you can kind of see it on the right, and I will show it right now. So uh, just starting off, basically this is the Python script uh, for the data cleaning. So uh, down here, basically you can see uh, so, uh, some of the, for the column for longitude and latitude, uh, some of the kind of entries were just hashtag null uh, rather than an actual number. And so in order to kind of clean that up, basically any time there was a null, we eliminated it, and any time there was actually a number, we just kept it. Uh, so that was pretty simple. Uh, and then next, down here, uh, essentially the uh, time that an employee spent at a company uh, was quite different in the like uh, in the entries. So some uh, entries would be years, months, weeks, or days even. Uh, and so we basically wanted to make sure that everything was in one uh, kind of uh, like we wanted to keep it in years. Uh, so this was kind of the Python script for that and uh, the data down here. Uh, so that was kind of the uh, demo for the data cleaning. And next, uh, we can look at the Figma model for the front end. Uh, so this is what we're kind of hoping uh, that it will look like uh, later on uh, by the end of the semester. Uh, so down here, we have quick description. Again, what you're inputting and uh, how it can help with research. Uh, down here, again, contact. And this is where kind of the cool stuff is in making the queries. So we have this game selection uh, tab. Uh, basically, for each table, you can select. Uh, and there, these are drop downs. Uh, you can select essentially uh, a question uh, from the survey that you want to kind of identify the responses for. Uh, and then on the right is, again, just which category you want to look at. So there were a lot of categories in the data sets. Again, these data sets are huge. So 
So this is why we kind of want to make uh, pretty simple queries. Uh, so yeah, essentially this is kind of like what the um, front end will look like and how the users can make pretty complex queries in a very simple manner. Uh, so again, let's jump back into the presentation. And uh, lastly, uh, kind of looking at the timeline, again, uh, mentioned the introduction phase, so kind of cleaning the data and outlining a rough draft. Then we'll, we're essentially going to store the data in MySQL and then establish a connection in AWS. Uh, lastly, we'll establish a server that basically gathers the inputs from the user on the front end, again, like what queries they're making, their account information, all that, and formulate it into SQL queries and store their individual user information data. Uh, lastly, uh, we have testing, so ensuring that the website is kind of displaying the data and visualizing it correctly. Uh, so yeah, that's essentially the timeline of our project and the progress we've made so far. Uh, yeah, cool. And uh, we can open up your questions now. Oh yeah, they were. Yeah, that, that uh, the Google Cloud was actually something that we considered and kind of are still considering uh, because again, uh, Google Cloud is something that a lot of members, including myself, are familiar with uh, com compared to AWS. But from what I saw, is AWS RDS was uh, kind of like it had its own relational system built in, which is kind of like the whole overview pro uh, goal of the project. So that's kind of what we looked at. But again, uh, that's the that's still in consideration, so we, we may or may not uh, end up using Google Cloud in the future. Any other questions? Sorry, I, I might have missed it. Uh, how much data do you think will be removed by, uh, or will be not in there because you had to remove it because of the wrong entry? So, so like, how much would that impact the, the representative being represented? Yeah, definitely. So, um, what we kind of wanted to focus on is ensuring that all the data is maintained uh, because we didn't want to eliminate any of the responses again to maintain the kind of uh, structure of it. Uh, what we did focus on is essentially trying to remove all the areas where there was either something you put it wrong, uh, like uh, like the hashtag and all that, as I mentioned earlier, again, that would be helpful later on. Uh, but in terms of like things like time period, we again wanted to maintain all that data, just put it into like one uh, kind of like uh, unit. So we set, uh, set it as years. And in other, any other situation, we basically just want to maintain all, all the data as best as we can. So the team basically just looks in really deeply as like, okay, if something's wrong, like what is the correct input? Like what did we think that they were trying to input? And uh, that's something that can be discussed with the, uh, or the professor that's kind of helping us with this project. So. Yeah, yeah, so basically uh, the AWS, uh, kind of like what we're trying to focus on using that for is essentially it um, allows to get the data, so like using an API, so it would extract data from the back end. And AWS RDS has its own feature where you can input like CSVs um, of the data sets into, uh, into AWS, and then um, basically we would gather the data and kind of like develop again a server that I mentioned earlier that gathers those requests and just puts it on the, the, uh, the website. And, um, another focus is again trying to get the user's inputs, so like what queries do they want to make, and that's something that will happen in the back end like with SQL. So. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, even you have your back Um, from my research on AWS, uh, that's kind of like what um, was seen is that like uh, the front end and back end are all completely tied. Uh, so that's kind of like what the plan is. And again, if that ends up being a struggle later on, uh, the Google Cloud is something that is completely available to us and something that we might end up using as part of uh, this. And so to answer that a little bit further, RDS uh, is kind of unique in the sense that it doesn't require you to connect to other AWS. I know that DynamoDB does that, 
but with uh, RDS, you're completely able to use whatever front end you want and still use RDS as like its own API, uh, being able to use uh, SQL queries um, from a front end, uh, separate from AWS to that RDS backend. Oh, okay, that, that answers that question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Could you talk about the performance of the queries? Like if I, you say that it's a huge data set. Yeah. So if I were to run a query, uh, did, you, did, did you do some testing uh, considering how fast it would take uh, to get the data run? Yeah, it, um, it, it, again, it's a SQL query, so making SQL queries, uh, kind of like the biggest part was actually inputting the data sets into like the storage, so like putting into MySQL, that took a while, um, but actually making queries and like, getting the data is like super fast. Um, uh, the team basically did like some like sample test queries uh, on MySQL itself, and it outputted the results like immediately, uh, so kind of like displaying the results shouldn't take too long. Uh, again, if a user is making a big query, like they say they want to select an entire like column or like a bunch of data, that might take maybe a little bit, a few more seconds. But otherwise, data is displayed like, pretty uh, spontaneously. So yeah. Last question. This is from the chat. Uh, someone said, "I see there's many missing values in your data set in your Google Colab. How are you handling that or working around it?" Oh yeah. Values? So yeah, there are definitely a lot of uh, kind of missing entries, and so this is something that you know we kind of discussed uh, uh, with the team, but. Um, again, if there are no responses in the as like in the entries, like we basically just left it and kind of kept only the ones that we wanted to keep. Sometimes left uh, like blank entries had some meaning to it. Like for example, like had saying like leaving a blank would be a response basically to a question. Um, so that those are things that we took into account. But for the majority of the thing, like uh, uh, a lot of the empty entries, we just kind of like didn't consider them. We wanted to only focus on the ones that had a value in it. Okay, thanks guys. Hello everyone, my name is Ishan. I am the product manager for AI Essay this semester. Uh, my other tech lead wasn't able to come, he's been sick this week. Um, so the goal of AI Essay is an automated essay grading and feedback. So, Basically what we wanted to do is for a student and for a teacher to have an access to upload their essay, the prompt of their essay, uh, and a rubric, and based on these inputs and these essays, our model can actually grade it based on this rubric and give detailed feedback based on how the rubric is made. So our first thing we did was data pre-processing and this was standardizing and anonymizing at the database of uh, Business Administration Bio A courses essays we received we first received, and this was mostly last semester's work where um, we were first trying to do our model on these specific business course. Um, we decided this semester to take a different route, but this was an important step in uh, our progress. Um, we also had uh, our main NLP analysis, which was fine tuning. And NLP models such as BERT and GPT and GPT-3 to uh, identify scoring metrics on grammar and content relevancy of the essay. Okay. Uh, and then we had a visualization for our front end, and this was where the user would input their prompt, the rubric, um, and their essay, and by clicking the button to upload, uh, they would get their feedback. And to combine our, our front end and with our model, uh, we were using AWS architecture, which integrated the AWS Lambda functions and DynamoDB to improve scalability and performance of our model. So uh, rubric grading is basically, you're given a rubric for the essay, and we then apply the MP techniques to accurately grade the essay as if the model was a tier professor for that course. So our approach for actually trying to find ways to grade this essay given based on a rubric, um, we had different, different techniques, and one of them was uh, named entity recognition to identify specific terms, concepts, or entities mentioned in the essay that are relevant to the rubric. We also have parts of speech tagging, which identify noun, verbs, adjectives, to identify keywords and phrases in the essay to reflect that reflected a clear understanding uh, of the response of the 
prompt. Um, and actually, a dependency processing which would identify relationships between words in a sentence, uh, which is helpful in identifying the thesis of that essay, uh, and then seeing if the student was providing supporting evidence uh, for the for the thesis to the prompt. Um, next, we wanted to check for similarity matching. Um, this is, includes keyword matching to identify rubric elements that contain uh, similar phrases and words seen. Um, in the essay, uh, and then entity recognition, which identifies relevant terms and concepts uh, for the rubric in the essay, and then lastly, semantic similarity, uh, which identifies rubric elements that are semantically similar to the essay's components. So our NLP analysis uh, this semester has been, in the first part of it, a lot of experimentation. Um, so we dived into BERT, um, which is a pre pre-trained neural network model uh, to find word embeddings and similarity scores. Uh, we also use uh, the BERT zero shot classification. And this is basically an example of transfer learning, which generally refers to using a model uh, trained for one task in, in a different application than it was originally trained for. Um, so that pretty much means uh, if you want to find like thesis, a supporting evidence, we can try to find those classifications given in the essay. Uh, and then we use chat GPT, or not chat GPT, GPT-3 model to uh, find text of vector embeddings uh, to quantify overlap of relevant rubric categories and the essay composition. So here's uh, a very small to read, I apologize for the small images, uh, but it's an example of output from our experiments. So uh, given a sample essay, I uh, can't really read that. Um, this first part of my, my cursor is, at, is at the name entity recognition. So what the script does is it returns a object um, of what type of, uh, of mostly um, organizations, locations, persons of the essay. So like here is how I put in NASA, Mars, so like nouns. Um, and we were going to, based on the rubric given, match that with uh, key concepts. Uh, of that rubric and see if that was in the essay. Uh, next, we checked for bird similarity, and this was just vectorizing embedded vectors, um, and then checking cosine similarity to see how similar text in the essay was to the prompt in the rubric. Um, and then lastly, uh, we tried the zero shot from the bird classification, um, and this basically has uh, candidate labels and thesis evidence analysis and then gives a score based on uh, if those categories are evident in the essay. So um, after doing the experiments, we realized there's some problems and uh, we wanted to be realistic with what we could actually do with solving this issue and actually having a viable product. Um, and we realized that making our own model from scratch tend to be inaccurate and inefficient most of the time. Uh, and this is mostly because there's a lack of data. You need a lot of essays with attached rubrics that have already been graded so you know you're training correctly. And this needs a significant amount of computing power and memory, storage resources that would actually grade these essays. Um, and you also need to be careful with feature engineering uh, and the people model that actually grades essays. You have the rubric requires a lot of strict data processing and cleaning, and just fine tuning a pre trained model on a specific task. This requires a lot of selection of hyperparameters, optimization strategies, and evaluation metrics, which is taking way too much time. So our solution was actually using the GPT-3 model with the prompt engineer. So OpenAI API um, is already pre-trained on a massive amount of text from the internet. So what we decided to do was uh, we sent an API request with a given context, and we do the context here. Um, it's basically we are giving it a um, context prompt that says, you are an essay grader receiving essays based on a prompt and a rubric. Return a JSON object made of two keys, score and commas. Score is an integer score of the essay based on the rubric scale. Commas is an array of JSON objects where each object contains two keys, section and feedback. In each feedback, you give feedback on a specific section of an essay based on the prompt and rubric. In section, return the exact text section of the essay that the feedback is based on. 
So based on this prompt that we're sending to the API, we're getting specific results um, where it scores automatically and it gives, um, it selects certain parts of the essay uh, and then returns uh, feedback for that. Um, and we've been testing this mostly on um, AP uh, government and SAT essays that already have a rubric attached to it. Uh, and then that has been created by a human. Um, and so far what we've seen is that is giving a very accurate and similar scores um, to the, the AP and SAT essay scores. So just to go over prompt engineering, uh, prompt engineering is a process of designing and crafting prompts or starting phrases to provide guidance and context to the AI image model in order to generate specific outputs or responses. Um, so we saw uh, given um, the last prompt in the last slide. So uh, for our front end, we wanted to have a way for the user to optimize their context prompt. Um, and we basically, the user would be able to um, type in saying, hey, I want more leading grading or I want more detailed feedback on a specific section of the rubric. Um, and based on that, the uh, GPT-3 model would provide that feedback. So um, the rest of the semester, uh, we decided to um, go away from training our own model and using the API. Um, so currently, we are working on a full static web application using the OpenAI API, uh, where we do a get request that returns a score and from the given rubric um, and the focus feedback in a form of JSON, uh, then specific context prompt that can be adjusted by the user. Um, and then the front end UI, where the, the user can input their essay, their prompt, and their rubric. And then lastly, um, as a result, the highlighted feedbacks uh, on the parts of the essay graded, um, either from the JSON and the actual score from the rubric. So currently, uh, on the on so my one of the, the people who are working on the front end right now finished a lot of the work today morning, um, so I wasn't able to actually show any of you guys the demo, which is unfortunate. But I hope to get I think a working demo by the end of this week um, or next week. Um, so currently, our, our React front end is just having the user login where you can enter the essay prompt the rubric. Um, and this is where the, there's also a grade view, which would show the highlighted feedback uh, based on the rubric um, and then the current score. And the back end, we're creating the back end API call that will accept the essay rubric, essay prompt, and context prompt, which then, from that, those given inputs would turn into JSON object uh, that will be used on the front end for the feedback highlighting. And then lastly, um, we will use AWS Cloud. Um, we will upload text inputs as text files to the AWS S3 bucket and then use the AWS Lambda function to execute the OpenAI API call, which then our DynamoDB that we have will store the JSON output for the user. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any questions? Let's give a round of applause. About out of time, so I think if there's questions, you can come up. I think all the presenters are still here, but if you guys have a few minutes to stick around, if you guys, if anyone has questions, you can uh, talk to the presenters individually. So thank you so much for coming. I'm jealous of all the innovation you guys are doing. Don't take it for granted what you're able to do right now. A lot of cool stuff, uh, pioneering, using data. So thank you all for coming. We'll be back the first Friday uh, in May. Have a great weekend. Thank you.